Howdy and welcome to episode 55 of T-Shirts and Shawls. I'm Karen and today I am recording on Wednesday, May 23rd, 2018. So this is a special episode. It is the two-year anniversary of starting the podcast. Uh, I believe it was May 26th, 2016 that I started. So um, just a couple of days early, but we're calling this our two-year celebration. And this is going to be a different episode than normal because I will be answering your questions that you posted. So instead of doing the usual structure, um, I'm just pretty much going to be answering questions. So last time, if you watched the podcast, I introduced Luna to you. Um, she will probably be in my lap for most of this recording because i um, just trying to make sure I keep an eye on her and that she's not getting into trouble. She and the cats have been having lots of fun together. Um, but uh, so we'll, we'll kind of see how that goes. Um, she might be a little active. I, good thing that I kind of record the podcast in segments so I can stop and maybe go take her out and play with her for a little bit. Um, I think she's kind of in that mode right now. But anyway, we'll go ahead and, um, and work on this episode. So like I said, not a usual episode since I will mostly be answering your questions. So I've taken all of the questions that were posted in the Q&A thread, as well as two questions that were posted in the Questions for Karen thread, and I've tried to kind of sort them in an order that makes sense to talk about them. So I've got them all posted um, in the order on, um, on Trello. I, I think I showed you guys Trello before, so here's my, here's my list. Probably can't really see it, so there's my list. Um, these are the little cards, all of these down here. I was able to uh, basically sort them and rearrange them, so it made it really easy to do that. Anyway, so we'll go ahead and get started with the first question. So the first question comes from Lizen PLZ, so L-I-Z-E-N-P-L-Z, um, and she asks, is there a color you will never, ever knit with? Yes, burnt orange. No. <laughs> um, I'm an Aggie at Texas A&M, so um, when I went to A&M, uh, A&M and UT were still very much rivals. Um, they no longer play each other in football, they're in different conferences, so that rivalry is not quite as, as much as it used to be. Um, anyway, and so the, the UT colors are, are burnt orange um, and white, so, um, so probably I, I would feel kind of weird using that color because um, not that that necessarily you get brainwashed when you go to, to A&M, but there are definitely the traditions and everything that, that go, go into it. Um, and uh, having that rivalry is, is a little bit part of it. Um, as far as other colors, um, there are colors that I don't love. Um, I'm not a huge yellow person. I really, I mean, despite the little burnt orange thing, I really don't like orange that much. Um, I say that and then I'm using orange in something I'm knitting right now. Um, but, uh, but I really don't think that just a, I could say like this color is completely out. I would never ever use it. Um, because I think that that's one of the, the things that's kind of fun about, about dyeing and about knitting that you can, um, you can experiment and try things. And uh, there was, a, I knit a bright yellow shawl for my mother-in-law because yellow is her color. She looks good in yellow. Um, and I knew that she would really like that. So, so I did that. I used the kind of neon yellow in my Exploding Tardis um, shawl. So although there are definitely colors that I, I don't use very often, um, there are reasons to use them. So I don't really wanna put a, a never in, in front of any colors. Um, but I did, I did think about this for a while, thinking, really, is there a color I, I really wouldn't want to knit with? Um, I think as long as, as long as I have a purpose, and usually it would be, you know, knitting for some other person or some other reason, um, then I would probably knit with pretty much any color. This question comes from Care Bear, and this was in the Questions for Karen thread. Uh, lately, I have seen some indie dyers who say their yarn has excess dye in it, so to wash it before you use it. I have only washed finished items. So do you wash the skein in hang form, or do you ball cake it up first? Then do you hang for days to dry, in, if in hang form, or somehow put it on a blocking board? 
I don't know. I just don't know what to do. Thank you for your help. Okay. So I've got, I'm going to kind of answer um, the, the actual questions and then I'm going to answer a question that wasn't asked directly, um, but I think it's kind of an important part of this. Okay. So if you feel like you need to wash the yarn, you should do it while it's still in a hank form. And I should have grabbed, um, I should have grabbed something that I could, I could show you guys. Uh, so yes, yeah, so while it's still in that, that hank, um, the loop of yarn basically. Um, because that's going to be the best way to make sure that all of it gets washed and also that it dries well. If you've already got it caked or balled, then the center of that is not going to dry very fast and you really don't want that to happen. Um, so definitely leave it in the, the hank form. You want to make sure that there are ties, the little choke ties um, that are placed in several places throughout the skein, throughout the hank. Um, I usually use four ties whenever I um, prepare mine for sale. And now I'm moving my hand so Luna wants to bite my fingers. We'll give her a chew toy. Um, so use, use those choke ties. I usually have four. Um, there are some dyers who don't put any on their yarn. They just have the, the beginning and end of the, um, of the yarn tied together. Um, if you have a, a hank like that, add your own ties. It could just be some some random cotton yarn, even just some random wool yarn, since all you're doing is washing. It doesn't really matter. Just little pieces just to, to tie it off. So that way you don't risk getting your yarn in a huge tangle because do not want to do that at all. Um, so if there aren't enough um, ties on there, add your own. Then really to wash it, all you need to do is soak it. You don't need to like go through a huge heavy process. Um, you basically want to have uh, maybe a series of, of buckets or, or something like that, um, whatever you, you have to hand, uh, maybe even directly in your sink, um, kind of however you feel, you usually like um, however you soak things when you block stuff. Um, so, just basically put it in the water, kind of see is there a loose dye, um, does the water, you know, turn, uh, turn colors, um, take it out of there, refresh the water, get clean water, um, put it back in. Um, usually between each, uh, each washing, I will um, kind of squeeze out the water so that way um, more water will be able to, to soak in at each time. If you are noticing a lot of dye in the water, you can use, um, some people use the color catchers that you can get for laundry. Um, so you can put that in your water. I also, there's a um, something called Synthropol that you can use um, just adding a, a little, little tiny bit of Synthropol. It basically keeps the dye molecules suspended in the water so they don't try to reattach themselves to the yarn, which at that point, um, they're not going to reattach themselves if it's truly excess. Um, so it will keep the, the dye molecule suspended in the water rather than trying to reattach to the yarn. Um, and that will help kind of keep, um, keep it from bleeding. So um, then when you are done, squeeze it out, um, squeeze out as much water as possible. And then this is why I wanted to, meant to grab a, a skein to hang to show you. Basically, um, take the loop, make sure she's got the bone so I don't wave the bone around. Um, take the loop, put it over your hands, and then snap your hands out several times so, um, and kind of move the loop around each time and snap your hands out. That just kind of um, straightens things out a little bit um, and makes it easier when you do go to, after it's dry, to wind the yarn. It'll be a little bit easier. Whoa! Okay. Um, so, so do that and then hang it to dry. Um, hang it, um, I used to, now I use a, um, a drying rack, um, which if you have a drying rack, just, you know, lay it over the drying rack. Um, I used to just take hangers and hang it, um, basically the loop around the, the top of the hanger and then hang it on my, um, shower rack. And that's how I used to dry the yarn. Um, so I put it in the shower in case I didn't squeeze out enough water and it dripped a little bit. Now I use a, um, a, a spin dryer to to get the um, get the water squeezed out more. But if you're just doing a skein, you should be able to just squeeze it out by hand, um, and then hang to dry. Do not add any weight or anything else on the skein. Just let it hang naturally and let it dry. So let me make sure that I've got um, 
so it might take days. It depends on your um, it depends on your your climate. Um, right now in, in Texas here, it's it's getting warmer, so I'm noticing things are drying really quickly. Um, when it's rainy or in the colder weather, it can take a few days, even when I put things in the spin dryer to dry. So yep, just leave it to hang until it's dry, and then you can go ahead and cake it up. So hopefully that answers the how to wash. Um, okay, so here's the other part of it. You say, lately I have seen some indie dyers who say their yarn has excess dye in it, so to wash it before you use it. If truly they mean it has excess dye, I would not buy from that indie dyer. They should not be selling yarn that they know has excess dye in it. They should be doing the washing out of the yarn and getting the excess dye out. You should not be responsible for excess dye. So if they truly mean it is excess dye, they should be doing the washing, not you. That being said, yarn does bleed sometimes. And I've talked about this, I know I wrote about it in my newsletter, and I'm pretty sure I've talked about it on the podcast before, that because dyeing involves chemistry, um, based upon how the yarn interacts with your water, if your water is very different from mine, for example, um, then it can cause yarn to bleed. If you use too much soap or the wrong type of soap, um, it can make the, the water um, too high on the um, base, side, <clears throat> base side of the pH scale and acid dyes need water to be more acidic in order to bond the, um, the molecules. There are some colors such as red and um, turquoises that the dye molecules are a little larger and so sometimes they don't bond completely. Um, and that is not excess dye, that is, that is chemistry, that is um, you know, making sure that the, the dye has, has bonded. And although I do my best, and I know most dyers do their best, um, to rinse their yarn and make sure that, um, that definitely any excess dye is out, but make sure that the yarn is as bonded as possible. Again, differences in water um, can, can cause the yarn to bleed. Um, so that, that unfortunately um, does happen sometimes, and that um, is not necessarily the dyer's fault. Like I said, that, that is chemistry. But again, if it is truly excess dye, that is something the dyer should take care of. Um, there are some, so I'm, I'm a, I use acid dyes because I dye wool and, and fiber, uh, um, animal-based fibers. Plant-based fibers, cotton and whatnot, use a completely different dye and completely different process. And that process actually involves a lot of rinsing. Um, a lot of people say that, especially if they dye, dye cotton, that they use a lot of water um, and go through that in their dyeing process. So, um, so if you have something like that, that is a kind of a completely different, um, different type of thing. But for for wool, for acid dyes, um, yeah, that's uh, bleeding can happen, like I said, but if it truly is just excess dye, the dyer has not done his or her job. So just wanna be completely honest about that. Um, I hope that answers your question. The next question is from AC Sparky 89 How can you stop superwash scarves from growing? Yeah, good question. Um, so I mentioned on a previous episode, I don't remember which one now, but I talked about the way that wool has scales. So if you actually look under a microscope, you can see these little scales in the wool. And that is why um, wool that felt will felt together because those scales um, basically rub against each other and start intermesh intertwining um, and that creates felting. So the superwash process basically removes those scales, or smooths down the scales, um, or removes them. There are kind of different processes. Um, and when that happens, the yarn becomes a lot slicker. So when you have slick yarn, instead of intermeshing, it's just going to slide right across each other. So your stitches, instead of gripping each other, they are going to slide. So that is the nature of superwash yarn. So kind of knowing that, knowing that that is the tendency for superwash yarn, there are some things that you can do to, um, to kind of work with that tendency to grow. So the first biggest thing to do is swatch. And um, swatches lie all the time, but 
really to kind of know how the yarn is going to behave in your project, in your stitch pattern. First of all, you should swatch in the stitch pattern. So you might do a gauge swatch, just that's just in stockinette. But you should also, if it's really something that, that concerns you, um, you should do a swatch in the stitch pattern of your project. And you need to do a pretty decent sized swatch to really get some good, um, some good information and good data to work with. So um, at some point you might just want to start your project instead of doing a big swatch. Just start the project and then block it while it's still on the needles. Sorry about that. I have a little trash can in here that I put yarn clippings in. Um, and Eva loves to try to tip that over and run off with the yarn clippings. So that's what she was just trying to do. Um, okay, so swatching, oh, swatching in the pattern of your project. So you may, like I said, just want to start your project and then block it while it's still on the needles. And you can do, um, you can put it on waste yarn if you want to do a full wet blocking or you can spritz it down um, and really well and get it, get it wet while it's still on the needles. Um, so that's the best way to really see how that particular yarn in that particular pattern is going to behave. And you might find out that although your gauge swatch um, in Stockinette said that you need this size needle to match the gauge, once you actually start working in the stitch pattern, you may realize that that needle is actually too big. And that's usually the problem. If, if something is growing, it's because your needle is, is too big. So you want a smaller needle, basically a tighter gauge. So your, your gauge actually, yes, Luna, give me kisses. Um, your gauge may actually need to be tighter than even what the pattern calls for um, just to kind of work with the, the, the growth that the superwash yarn is going to have. Um, so a tighter gauge is going to be um, one of the things. The other thing that you can do, and this, this kind of goes along with gauge, um, is look at the way you're knitting. So a lot of people, so it's your right, if unless you're knitting left-handed, if it's your right-hand needle, the, the needle that you're using to form the stitches that sets up the gauge. Um, and so your left-hand needle is not quite as important. So um, you wanna make sure that your right-hand needle, you are knitting onto the, um, the actual uh, needle itself and not the tip because if you knit on the tip then technically that's a smaller needle and, and your gauge is tighter um, but your left hand needle it doesn't really matter if you're knitting off of the, um, the the widest point or if you're knitting off the tip so what you can do is actually and again I should have had a little example is bunch up all your stitches to be worked on your left hand needle and um, have them on the tip of the needle and then when you knit them onto your right hand needle just knit them as normal you know placement on the right hand needle but by bunching all those stitches up on your left hand needle what you're basically doing is not allowing the stitches to stretch a lot because if you um if you have your stitches really spaced out on your left hand needle and you have to um either work at it um wow i don't have anything to hand to, to show um if you have to kind of stretch to to get that stitch onto your right hand needle that starts to stretch the fabric itself out which in superwash wool since you're trying to negate some of that that stretching and growing um that can contribute to to extra um extra yarn extra fabric extra growth so kind of bunching those those stitches up on your left hand needle at the tip of the left hand needle and working off it from there will keep the stitches so they're not um not getting uh, stretched out. So that's something you can do. Some people say putting it in the dryer helps. I'm not necessarily going to recommend that. I will just say that there are some people who find that that will help. Your mileage may vary. You may want to experiment. You probably don't want to throw something that you dearly love and you would be um, heartbroken if it gets ruined into the dryer, but some people do that. Experiment with a swatch. So really, um, just kind of knowing that Superwash is going to do that and um, kind of preparing for that in advance is something, um, something that you can do. As far as a project that's already finished, which Elizabeth, I suspect you're probably talking about the scarf that you made. Um, 
there's not a whole lot that you can do um, when you block it. You want to make sure, so when you put it in the, in the water to soak, you want to make sure that when you pull it out of the water that you are fully supporting it, that you are not letting any part of it droop and grow, that you are keeping it in your hands, putting it on the, the blocking mat and not you know, lifting it up and letting it, letting it drip down. Um, so that is definitely something you can do um, that can help out. You might also, instead of doing a full wet blocking, you might do a steam or a, um, a spritz blocking so it's not fully soaked. Um, depending upon what the what the stitch uh, stitches are, um, you might be able to get away with with doing a, a, a lighter blocking rather than a full wet blocking. So that's also something that you can try. Um, trying to think of other things once the the project is already complete. Um, really, that's the that's the biggest thing. Just being being extra careful in the blocking that you're not doing anything that contributes toward that growth. And um, because wet, wet wool is heavy, when you let it kind of pull down on itself when it's wet, that is definitely something that you want to avoid. Uh, so I hope that helps um, planning for future projects and possibly for projects that have already been made. So the next question, and I'm really sorry if I get your name wrong, um, P-I-L-A-R and Mike, Pillar, Pillar, um, please let me know how to pronounce that. Um, question says, I'd like to know more about your designing process, inspiration, method, etc. Do you test your knitting as you plan or do you plan it all out then give it a test? So um, I think I've talked about the design, my designing process uh, on a, a previous podcast episode, but I don't remember which one. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, it's back there somewhere. But basically, um, my every project is a little bit different, um, every pattern, but my basic idea is that I think, okay, I feel like designing a shawl. So I think that I want to design a shawl that's triangular. So I kind of start off with, with, uh, with thinking of, of those types of things. Okay, so I've got a triangular shawl. So I actually get graph paper out and I draw out the shape. Do I want it to be um, you know, a right triangle? Do I want it to be more of an elongated type of triangle? Um, and I use graph paper and I actually like graph out the shape of, of the shawl. And then I think about um, stitch patterns that will fit well into that shape because um, thinking about kind of the width of a stitch pattern and how many stitches it has and the repeats, um, it kind of seems really matters with how it fits in the shape. Um, I didn't always do that early on, and so I think it was, I think it's the the Asalot shawl just has chart after chart after chart, like every single thing, um, row had to be charted because there was no repeat whatsoever. Um, and that's a pattern that you really can't um, just add in extra repeats to, to make bigger because of that. So that was, I th that was actually my first shawl that I designed. So I've learned a lot about designing um, after that experience. So kind of thinking about a stitch pattern that is going to, um, to work within that shape. And then I have stitch pattern books. Um, th there are occasionally times where I've come up with my with my own stitch pattern, but um, not alone. A lot of designers have a ton of stitch pattern books, and I flip through those books a lot and look at various stitch patterns, and um, and and see what you know kind of jumps out at me. And it's kind of fun. Um, I will put sticky notes in in a particular book, and um, and then go back maybe like several months later and look at those, and I'll be like oh, I can't believe that I liked this stitch pattern. I don't like it anymore. Um, so even just in a few months, my taste on, on stitch patterns change. Um, so I get I get ideas. Sometimes I will use a stitch pattern directly from, from a stitch dictionary, which most stitch dictionaries are meant for this, this purpose. Um, and sometimes I will um, see a stitch pattern and think, I'd like that, but I think I would like it better if, and make some changes. Um, and then I and then I chart things out and I, I plan it all out. So I'm a, a pre-planner. I definitely like to um, have my idea. Sometimes I even write out the the pattern or a very um, a skeleton of the pattern. Um, and then I sit down and work on a sample. And as I'm working on the sample, sometimes things change because sometimes I realize what was on paper didn't actually work out so well. Um, and sometimes my plan works really well and, and I knitted exactly as I, I had planned. Um, 
I've learned that I need to really make sure that I take notes as I'm working on the sample because sometimes I will think, oh, well, I'll remember what I did here or I'll remember this change or I'll make kind of a cryptic note, which made complete sense to me when I wrote it. But going back um, a month later when I'm sitting down and actually writing out the pattern, I look at it and think, hmm, I have no idea what this means. Um, so I, I've, I've learned to definitely um, be very clear in the notes that I make for myself. So yes, so some things will change on the needles um, and, uh, and, and develop kind of as I go. But for me, I like having the plan beforehand. Um, there are some designers who are a complete like on the needle designers that they, they will sit down and say, I want to knit a shawl and they just kind of start knitting and, and write out what they do as they go. Um, I like to have a plan. So, so that's what I do. Um, let's see. So inspiration myth. Yeah. So inspiration, sometimes it is a particular story. So I knew with, when I was designing the cows for the parliament of cows, I knew the story ahead of time. So I was really thinking about, um, the ideas of love and, um, and, um, and all of that that goes along with that story. So that's why there were a lot of hearts that ended up in that one. Um, and then other times it will be a stitch pattern itself that I'll be flipping through a stitch pattern dictionary and thinking, oh my gosh, I am in love with this stitch pattern. I have to do something with it. Um, and so it'll actually be the stitch itself that is the inspiration. So I guess um, I get inspired from, from a couple of different angles, um, either the story or a stitch pattern. There are some people who get inspired by images um, by um, things that that they're seeing in nature or um, kind of architecture. I know several people who get inspiration that way. <clears throat> but for me, it's either the story or um, a stitch pattern. The next question comes from Christy Rose, and this is posted in the Questions for Karen thread. If someone wanted to use round table yarns in an original design, do they ask your permission first? How does that work? First of all, if someone wants to use round table yarns for their design, yay, fantastic, go for it, definitely. Um, I, I am thrilled when a designer wants to use my yarn in his or her design. No permission is necessary. However, there is something called yarn support. Yarn support is when a yarn company will provide the yarn for the designer. Um, sometimes the yarn is provided for free and sometimes it is provided at a discount. It kind of depends on the arrangements and the company's um, usual practices. So with yarn support, the typical agreement is that, um, so if, if, I, if somebody is, is getting yarn support from me, that that person will only list my yarn in the pattern. Um, and that includes on the pattern itself as well as in the Ravelry database. So Ravelry, when you add a pattern to Ravelry, um, you can add as many different suggested yarns as you want. Um, I'm sure there's a limit somewhere, but you can add multiple suggested yarns that you feel will work for your, for your pattern. Um, and usually if someone has received yarn support, so actually getting free yarn or discounted yarn from the company, that the agreement is that they will only list that yarn as the suggested yarn for the pattern. Um, so so there, there are some arrangements that are slightly more formal. Um, but if somebody just buys my yarn and decides to use it to design a pattern, then that person is under no obligation to only list my yarn in the pattern um, or on, on the Ravelry page. Um, and I have had designers do both. I have had some designers that I have offered yarn support for um, and some designers who have bought my yarn and then um, designed something for it. I love it, especially if somebody has bought my yarn and I don't know that um, a design is being made. I really, really love it if the designer contacts me and lets me know, because that way I can share that design with my mailing list. Um, so far, every design that someone has made with my yarn has been fabulous and I have been excited to share it. Um, so, so I really enjoy doing that as part of the process. So whether or not they've actually gotten yarn support from me, um, uh, if they've designed something and I feel like it is something that my mailing list would enjoy, I have shared that with the mailing list. So that's exciting. I love working together with other designers. Um, I would actually like to do that more. 
I would really, really like to work with design other designers more and um, and either provide them with yarn support or if they want to, if they feel like they, they don't want to be under that um, only listing my yarn, um, they are definitely welcome to buy yarn and use it. Um, so I would definitely like to see that more. If you have a favorite designer, maybe encourage him or her to um, contact me and find out about yarn. Um, if you want to, to do a design um, and use my yarn, let me know. Um, again, something I'm, I'm really interested in and that I really want to do more of. So um, I've enjoyed the um, both the more formal yarn support as well as the informal, hey, I, I bought your yarn and I made a design with it. Um, there are bigger yarn companies that, um, so especially when I was early on designing before I started mostly using my own yarn, there were a few yarn companies that I used their yarn. And again, it was just something that I bought. It was not a formal yarn support type of agreement. Um, and I guess they noticed that I had used their yarn for my design and they actually posted about it on their, um, I, I remember one did it on their Facebook page and the other one, I think they were both on Facebook. Um, so just a little shout out. Hey, here's a, a design that was just released um, that uses one of our yarns. So that was really awesome. I didn't even contact the yarn company in those cases. So that was really fun to see. Um, and especially as a beginning designer, kind of getting that little boost um, of, uh, of recognition from the yarn company was a lot of fun. So in general, every yarn company is probably different, but in general, as a designer, you do not need to ask permission to use somebody's yarn in a pattern. There may be some company or some indie dyer out there that for some reason um, is, is not okay with that. I, again, I really think that we, we need to be working together, so I don't, I don't really see a problem with that. Um, but there, there, I know I have heard of just a, just a couple of stories, maybe even just one, um, where somebody did not like that a designer was using their yarn. But, um, but for the most part, we like working together. Um, no need to ask for permission, but if you wanna tell me about it, that's awesome because I would like to, to share the pattern and possibly even um, make the pattern myself. So um, yeah, let me know if you are interested in designing using round table yarns. So the next question comes from Christy Rose also. She has several questions. Um, how much time does the podcast actually take from start to finish? So um, basically, in I do the, the setup. So I've got my light that I set up, and then I've got my, my tripod and my camera, and I put a little microphone in my camera. I gather up all the, the stuff that I I'm, I'm want to talk about, um, and that probably takes 15 to 20 minutes to, to get set up. Then I sit down and actually start the recording. And because I do these in segments, sometimes I you know record a segment, hit stop, then immediately hit start and record the next segment. Sometimes I realize, oh, I forgot to get something that I wanted to talk about and I get up and I, um, I go get that. Sometimes I need to go get some water. Um, with Luna here, I had to take her out for a while and, and play with her because she was getting a little bit too overexcited. So, um, so let's say an episode is an hour long, it's gonna take me over an hour to record that because I am doing the, the starts and stops. Um, so maybe, maybe an extra 15 to 20 minutes in there if, if you kind of put it all together. Um, so it'll say an hour episode, an hour and 15 minutes to, um, to do the actual recording. Then I have to, because I record on my phone, I have to get the files from my phone to my computer so I can edit them. That used to be super easy. I just plugged in the little cable from my phone to my computer and I just basically, um, copied the files. About two months ago, um, I upgraded iPhones and my new iPhone does not seem to like talking to my computer very much. It's really annoying. Um, it doesn't always work if I, sometimes it'll work if I plug in the cable and, and try copying and sometimes it won't. So I've had to do things like try to upload to iCloud, which especially on a segment that's 15 or 20 minutes, um, takes quite a while to upload. And so that's why some of the, the most recent episodes have been um, released much later in the day because um, I've basically been fighting with my phone and my computer to get them to talk to one another. 
Ugh. Anyway, um, but normally if I were just transferring files, it usually takes um, maybe another 15 minutes to, to transfer the files from my phone to my computer. So for an hour long episode, now we're up to an hour and a half, an hour, and let's say it took me 20 minutes to get ready. So an hour and 50 minutes. Um, so now I've got the files on my computer. Now I need to edit them. So the first thing I do is I open Photoshop and I create the title page for the episode with the title and the episode number. Um, and then if there are any extra segments like this one, I will have the, the little cards that are in between that are different because this is a different episode. Um, then I create those extra little cards. Um, so that takes maybe like five minutes. And then I have to import. So I, I have a, um, an editing software that I use. So I have to import all the videos into the editing software. So that takes another usually about 10 minutes. So now we're looking at just over two hours. Um, then I do the editing. So I have to um, basically splice all of the different segments together. I cut off the beginnings and the ends um, of me basically reaching for the, um, the stop button um, or kind of making sure that you know everything is, is good to go. Um, so I have to cut those ends off. If I've added in, um, if I want to add in any text on the video itself, I have to go in and, and do that. I don't sit and watch the entire episode. Um, but I do, I do um, kind of watch bits and pieces of it to make sure everything is, looks like it recorded okay. So if in an hour long episode, I don't have to sit and watch the entire hour, but it does take me quite a while to edit it. So I would say um, probably 30 to 45 minutes to, to do the editing. Um, so now we're looking at two and a half, two hours and 45 minutes, somewhere around there for an hour long episode. Um, then I have to let the episode um, convert to the correct format. So my editing software, um, I basically tell it, okay, I want it to be an MP4, which is what YouTube likes best. Um, so I tell it to convert that, tell it what size and, and quality. Um, and my computer does that in the background. And that takes a while. For an hour long episode, it takes over an hour for it to convert to, that episode, to um, the correct format. The good news is I don't have to sit there and watch my computer for that hour or more. Um, it can just be running in the background. So that's not necessarily time that I spend. It's just time that my computer is working. Um, usually what I do during that time is that's when I write up the show notes. So I basically go to the website. I copy the show notes from the previous episode. Um, that way all of the things like uh, projects that I've talked about, all the links are already in there and the format is there. And then I remove all the stuff that, um, that I did not talk about in, in the, the current episode and I start typing things in. And sometimes that goes pretty quickly if there aren't a lot of, of new things to add in. Um, and sometimes that takes a lot longer if I have to go look up links for everything and add in links. And um, so that could possibly take another 30 minutes. Um, that's probably average, about 30 minutes to write up show notes. Sometimes it's a little faster, sometimes it takes a little bit longer. So we'll say 30 minutes. And I've already lost track. Um, I think we're, we're over three hours now, I think. <laughs> um, so, so I'm writing up the show notes and usually the computer is still working on converting that video when I'm done with the show notes. So I, um, you know, that's usually when I break for lunch and, and do something else. After the computer has converted from the show note, um, converted to the correct format, then I do the upload to YouTube. And uploading to YouTube, it kind of depends on my internet speed that day. Sometimes my upload is faster than others. It also depends on how long the episode is. Um, and that will take, again, over an hour to upload to YouTube. Um, and I, um, there are a couple of little things that I do to set it up on YouTube. I, I write out the little paragraph description, um, and then there are a couple of little settings that I change. I add keywords and, and different things. Um, so usually it's, it's kind of a, um, maybe about 15 minutes to get the upload going. And then again, I don't have to watch it. I just let my computer process it. Um, and then I can, I can do some other things. Other things including setting up the thread on Ravelry, make, getting that link, making sure to add that to the show notes, 
um, adding once um, adding, once I get the link for the show notes, adding that link to the Ravelry threads. It was kind of a lot of back and forth of making sure that all the links and all the things are set up in the right places. Um, so again, YouTube runs in the background, so I don't have to actively be watching that. Um, but it ta- usually takes, um, it can take two hours for it to upload to YouTube, um, depending on the, the length of the episode. Then, since I also upload this to iTunes, um, and iTunes, there are lots of different ways you go about uploading things to iTunes. You don't actually upload to iTunes, you upload to somewhere else, and, um, and then iTunes kind of gets the podcast from the other, from the host, basically. So the host that I'm using is a free host, and um, because of that, I try to make the file size a lot smaller. So um, I don't just use the same video that I used for YouTube. I actually um, re-convert the video, so I go back to my editing software, and I make the, the, um, basically the screen size much, much smaller, so it's a much smaller file size. Um, the quality is not as high, but um, but the file size is much swell, smaller. So I have to let that run in the background and convert that, and then I upload it to my host for that, and then I have to create the page on my website that um, will talk to iTunes, that will say, hey iTunes, here's another episode of the podcast. Um, so probably that takes another, again, the converting runs in the background, but setting it up, that probably takes another 20 to 30 minutes. So I'm, I've lost track of exactly how much time that I'm physically working on doing the podcast, um, plus all the time in the background. Um, I'm probably spending three and a half to four hours of actual working time on the podcast, and then my computer's doing the extra additional time to do all the converting and the uploading, which is why I might start at like 8.30 or 9 a.m., but I don't have an episode ready to go until, you know, 5 p.m. or something because it takes all that time both for me to do my side and the computer to do its side. Um, that was really, really long explanation, so that means this video is going to be even longer and take more time, but anyway. Um, so yeah, so when I say it takes a while and it takes a whole day to do the podcast, I really do literally mean that. The next question comes from Craft Mouse, who asks, what podcasts were your inspiration for you getting started and for the format you chose? I'd imagine you chose video over audio only so you could show off the yarn. Um, video over audio only. She had a hyphen in there. <laughs> so you can show off the yarn. Okay, yes. Um, first of all, I chose video because absolutely I wanted to be able to show the projects. Um, although I think there are some good audio only knitting podcasts out there. Um, a lot of times I really wish that I could see what the person is talking about. So um, it really wasn't much of a decision uh, to do to do video. So as far as specific podcasts that were um, kind of inspiration or models, um, two of them come to mind. The first is The Dyer's Notebook um, by Laura Jinx. She is the dyer behind Jinx Yarns, so G-Y-N-X. I've used um, some of her yarn. Um, I think her, her um, house cup self-striping, I made socks out of that. Um, although that's been a while, but that was on a podcast episode. Anyway, so um, I, especially um, when I was starting my podcast, I had been watching her podcast for quite a while. And so kind of the format as she herself was a dyer and thinking about um, how she structured her um, podcast episodes where she put the um, kind of the business stuff at the end of the episode. If you go back and watch the first like half dozen or so, I don't remember exactly when I changed, um, but the first half dozen or so episodes, I that my structure was like that. I talked all about you know my knitting and, and all of that stuff, and then at the end I said, now I'm going to give you updates on round table yarns and Karen Don designs. If you're not interested, you can turn this off and you won't miss anything, because that's what Laura said. Um, obviously, except using her yarn business. Um, and I've since decided that I did not like that format, that the dyeing and designing was a big part. And, and I'm not, I don't want to, to, to say, be against anything that, that Laura had decided. This is completely for me. Um, the dyeing and designing was such a part of what I'm doing 
that it felt um, it felt strange just completely separated out like that and so I, I folded it it folded it in more directly um, with the um, with the episode but that was originally why I, I had the structure kind of set up that way um, and then the other influence was the geeky Geeky Girls Knit Podcast, CC and Damie, the mother and daughter team. I, I did a review of their most recent book just a couple of episodes ago. Um, so their podcast has segments. So they, um, they break things down. They have themed segments. Um, and that's how they structure their podcast from, um, from week to week. And I really liked that idea. I really liked having specific segments because I thought that that would give, I, I like structure, if you haven't figured it out, I like things to be organized and neat and to have structure. Um, and so dividing it up into the segments, I really liked because I felt that that gave me um, a way to approach each episode and to plan out each episode. So, um, so I, I definitely used that idea and it was based on what I was watching them do. So those would be the two that that definitely um, I can I can consciously know that that they made an impact on how I set up this podcast. So the next question also is from Craft Mouse. What changes do you foresee for the podcast for your four year anniversary? So two years from now, um, you know, I, I thought about this a lot. And I think even just last month, I would have had a completely different answer than I have right now. Um, last month, I probably would have said in two years, I, um, I imagine the podcast uh, viewer numbers will grow and maybe we'll be seeing, you know, twice as many viewers and getting lots and lots of comments um, and feedback that maybe people are contacting me um, to do reviews of their products and books. Um, you know, like I said, I, I did the a review of CC and Amy's book, um, but but I don't really get contacted by, by other businesses. Um, and, and I know other podcasters that are, that have higher viewerships and, and are, are really popular. Um, they do get approached by, um, by other people to ask them to talk about their products, give reviews and whatnot. Um, so even a month ago, I probably would have said, that's what I want the podcast to do. I want to see it really grow and to become one of those really popular podcasts where people are contacting me and asking me to review their things. But in the past month, I really don't. I mean, if that happens, that happens. But that's not my goal. That's not really what I'm aiming for. To be honest, in two years, so on my four-year anniversary, I would love the podcast to pretty much be doing what it's doing now. Um, having people who really are excited about the episodes and looking forward to watching them. And even if it's not you know, 2000 people, totally okay with that. I am fine if it is a small handful of people who are enjoying this. I really appreciate that um, and and I love that. Um, I want to see um, the comments and the interaction on the, um, the threads, both on Ravelry and now there have been more comments on the YouTube um, videos as well. So I wanna see that continue. I want to see um, the community not necessarily growing in number, but just growing in um, growing in community, growing in discussion, growing in um, familiarity with one another and comfort to, to talk to one another um, in friendship. Um, and that's, that's the kind of growth that I want to see. Not necessarily that the numbers are big, but that the quality itself is, um, stays stays high um it nothing delights me more than seeing seeing you guys post comments but really the best thing is when you when you talk to each other that you're not just talking to me but that you comment on each other's posts especially on, on Ravelry I love that that is something that is really important to me and it's really been the past a few weeks that I've, I've, you know, I talked last time about um, about changing up my goals and realizing that the the goals and planning that I thought I um, were were my goals really aren't. Um, just being really excited about um, about what I'm seeing and about everything that's that that I already have, um, and as long as that continues, that's really what I want to see. 
Um, maybe that seems kind of like a little, a little bit of a sappy answer, but, but it truly is, um, what I want to see. I, I want to see the podcast still going. I want to see, um, people still excited about it, still wanting to talk to me and talk to other people. Um, so really that's, that's what I want to see for, um, two years from now for the fourth anniversary. So partially kind of going off of that, the next question from Christy Rose what have you learned from podcasting? Um, the first thing that I learned is that I can actually find something to talk about um, every other week. Part of me thought, oh gosh, how am I going to, um, to come up with something to say? And surprisingly for me, it hasn't really been as difficult as I thought it would be. Um, so that, that's exciting. So I, it's something that I've kind of learned about myself. Um, and I guess what I've also learned is that I can definitely commit to something, you know, um, the, the schedule um, and, uh, and sit down and do, um, and do the recording when I say that I'm, that I'm going to do it. I really am, I guess, proud of, of um, keeping up with that commitment. Um, the same goes for my newsletter, really making, being uh, consistent about that. So um, just being able to to have the, the episodes come out every other week and to do them and to have something to talk about, um, that's, that's what I've learned. I've learned that um, I guess you guys are actually interested in what I have to say, which in some ways is, um, is kind of scary. Um, it, it definitely makes me think about what I, what I have to say. Um, because I want to make sure that, um, I want to make sure that I'm not taking advantage of, of the platform. Um, so, so there is that, but I try not to think too much about what you guys are, are necessarily thinking or how you're going to react. Um, because if I do, then I'm afraid I'm, I would get like paralyzed and not, and feel like I, I couldn't say things because I'm, I'm worried too much. Um, so I guess that's kind of what I've, I've learned the most, A, that, that I'm able to come up with things to talk about, and B, that you guys actually um, are interested in what I have to say. And in fact, there was a comment from Harps57, um, and, and I'll read the whole comment. Um, Luna is so cute, so thank you for that. Um, Boston's are my mom's favorites, but right now we have a Texas Blue Lacey and she's a treasure. Um, growing up, I had Cocker Spaniels, and that's kind of the dog that I was familiar with. And um, when I say Cocker Spaniels, we had two. Um, but uh, so Boston is definitely a new territory for me. Um, lots of, of breeds of dogs are. Um, my husband is the one who researched dog breeds and, and decided on the Boston. Um, so I'm really happy. I'm really happy with her um, overall so far. I think she's a good addition to our family. Okay, so back to the, the podcast thing. Um, I always love seeing your co-hosts, but I have to admit that my favorite part of your podcast is what you choose to talk about and how it often turns my perspective of my life on its side. Ha! Huh. That. Thank you so much, first of all, for saying that. Um, I think that's what I've learned from, from the podcast and what I appreciate. Um, and just um, really being excited to, to hear what you guys have to say about each episode. Um, I have to admit, sometimes I um, re I go and refresh Ravelry and refresh and refresh after I've released an episode um, to see the first comment that comes in, you know, like, oh, you know, it, especially when I was being honest about the, the business side of things. Um, is that something that's going to go over okay? What are people going to think about that? Um, so I definitely um, appreciate your comments, but it's, but I mean, I gotta say, this is gonna go in my my kind of. I, I have a little file of emails called my happy emails file, um, and whenever I'm feeling a little bit a little bit down, um, sometimes I go read those, and um, and it helps to to know kind of remind my remind me of why I'm doing these things. Um, so so thank you. I'm gonna kind of take a screenshot of this um, and uh, and add that to my my little happy emails. Um, so thank you. Um, and then she says, I'm looking forward to the next yarn club. Whenever I get a purple package, I know I'll be happy even before I open it. So again, thank you for your comments. Uh, and then going off of that yarn club, I am actually making headway on the yarn club. I know how many months it will be. 
Um, and I've started writing out the story and experimenting with colors. I have the first three months planned out. Um, I'll just tell you it's going to be six months. So I've got half of it planned out. Uh, and I am continuing to work on that. So more news about the Yarn Club hopefully coming up next time. Um, so yes, making progress on that. But anyway, um, going back to, to what I've learned about the podcast, um, just really appreciate that you guys listen and, um, and I'm, I'm very humbled and, and grateful that, um, that I actually, um, give you, you guys things to, to think about. So thank you. So continuing off of that, uh, Dragon Fairy says, what is your favorite part of the podcast? And really my favorite part is interaction with you guys. Um, I do enjoy um, pulling out the, the projects that I've been working on and kind of seeing some of the progress that, that I've made um, from, from week to week. So, so that's enjoyable too. But really, even though this technically is me talking to a camera, um, really, I'm, I'm thinking about you guys, especially those of you who, who post comments um, whenever I'm recording the episodes and, and I'm trying to kind of imagine you um, sitting across from me and, um, and, uh, and listening and um, hearing your, your comments and thoughts. So my, my favorite part is, is, is the discussion, is hearing what you guys have to say. Um, again, might be a little, a little sappy, um, but that really is the best part. Um, and like I said before, when you guys talk to each other, when it's not just me talking to you and you talking to me, but talking all of us together, that is fabulous. And that's what I love. Um, I was actually thinking this morning um, about one of the, the literature classes that I taught that is probably my absolute favorite literature class. Not because of the literature itself. It was Introduction to Literature. You know, we were reading, I mean, we read some really great things in there, but, um, but you know, it wasn't my, my medieval literature, my, my passion, um, but it was probably my favorite class. And it was because that was a class where it wasn't just me asking questions and somebody would raise their hand and answer a question and then I would ask the next question. Um, they were actually talking to one another. And um, sometimes that would happen, you know, in other classes, but this is something that would happen pretty much every class period. Um, the class, the discussion would actually be a discussion. And um, that was the class that I think I was probably saddest when the, the semester ended. I'm probably thinking about it also because uh, today is Luke's last day of school. So in thinking about, um, thinking about back when, when I was in that um, semester to semester thing, saying goodbye at the end of each semester, um, well, it was always a little sad with that class in particular because the discussion was so wonderful. Really, really hated saying goodbye to them. And I guess maybe that's something that I like about the podcast, that it, it doesn't, um, there could be seasons, um, but, um, but it, does, it does continue. And I don't have to say goodbye um, after a, a semester or whatever, that we do get to continue and, um, and, and getting to know one another. And, and people come and, and people, people go. Um, always excited to see new people um, come into the the podcast and the discussion, but um, but yeah, it's it's that that interaction um, which I think is is really the the best part of doing the podcast. So another question from Christy Rose: If you could go, if you could get back to the beginning, is there anything that you would change? So I think um, probably the biggest thing that I would change is that I would have keep track of which shirts I have talked about already. Um, I need to go back through the episodes and make a list so that way I know which shirts in my closet I still can talk about on the podcast that I have not shown you guys before because a lot of times I've considered a shirt and then decided against it and used a different shirt, but in my head I don't remember if I actually did talk about that shirt or if I decided not to talk about the shirt, um, especially for the, you know, the, the first few episodes, I don't remember what I've talked about. So as a consequence, I have ended up buying a lot of new shirts because I know if they're new that I haven't talked about them yet. So I kind of, I guess I use the podcast as an excuse to get new shirts. So that's something that I would, would change and, and I know I can go back and, and make that list and, and I need to sit down and do that. Um, but yeah, just kind of keeping better track for myself of which shirts I've already talked about. Um, I did sit down at one point and make a list of the shawls that I've talked about. So I do have a list of just a small handful of shawls that I have yet to talk about. 
Um, so I do have that. I just need to sit down and do that with the shirts. The other thing that, um, and then I, I already kind of mentioned this a little bit, the other biggest thing that I would change is that at the beginning I would not have separated out the business from the personal knitting um, because dyeing and designing are a big part of what I'm doing in my day to day. Um, having that separation really felt unnatural and I, I did not like that. Um, so I, I did change that early on, um, but um, but I, I wish that I would. And I mean, it's all an experiment. It's fine. It changed. I'm I'm not upset that um, that I started doing it that way. But that's a, a realization I wish I'd had at the beginning. Um, that I didn't feel like that business and personal side had to be have such a huge separation. Um, so I guess that is something I would have changed. Um, otherwise, I probably would have looked at getting better lighting and, and other things more from the beginning. But, you know, it's all a process of trying to figure things out. Um, I'm sure for a while, uh, my trying to figure out where best to do the filming to get better lighting, that, there was a lot of experimentation with that. Um, so I wish I'd kind of figured those things out. I'm, I'm not necessarily 100% happy with the setup I have now. The background's a little bit boring. But, um, but yeah, um, some of those things I wish I'd, I'd kind of known from the beginning and changed. Um, otherwise, I don't know that there's a huge, um, a huge thing that I necessarily would have, have wished that I had done differently. Um, so, yeah, I'm overall kind of happy with with uh, with how things have gone so this one is mostly a comment um, but it kind of goes with the the answer to the previous one so this is from KTB um, she says I was watching your latest episode and humbled by your honesty regarding the business side of dying and how the ups and downs have affected you I love listening to dyers talk about the business side of yarn inventory dying vending the drama of vending etc I love yarn but I know that I don't want to deal with the business side of it that's a good realization to have um, and then I'll get to the rest of her comment in just a second. So um, thank you for saying that. Um, those days where I wonder, is it really okay that I'm not putting up a, a wall of separation between the business and personal side of things? Um, it is helpful to know that, that, um, that you guys actually do want to hear about those things. Because I do think that that is, I, I do think that transparency is important. Um, that when you are just dealing with a small business in this type of community where um, where working together is something that really adds to that aspect I think kind of knowing what goes on behind the scenes um, I, when I first started using indie dyed yarn so 2008 2009 um, I had no idea what that even meant I, I really really had no clue and I, I would have liked to at least have known a little bit more about it. Um, maybe not to the the same extent, because um, maybe if I'd really known the um, the business side of things, who knows how that would have affected uh, my business. But um, but I do think that transparency is important and kind of knowing um, kind of what's what's going on. Um, so as long as you guys want to hear about that side of things, I will continue to talk about it. So I appreciate when you when you let me know that you actually do enjoy that. Um, as far as the rest of your comments, I totally lost my knitting mojo earlier this year. Hopefully I can find it and finish a hat I started in your Tristan yarn for Houston Fiber Fest. So man, that's really rough. Um, I've, I've gone through through patches of, of losing my, um, my knitting mojo before. Um, I've, I've had um, different recommendations that I've posted in the past, uh, especially through my newsletter, about um, suggestions to get that back. Um, but I, I do hope that um, that you're you're um, able to to get back into to knitting and getting excited about it again. And, and I would definitely, whether or not you finish the hat, I would love to see you at Houston Fiber Fest. So um, stop by, say hi, make sure you tell me who you are so I can. Um, Sometimes, you know, um, I, I, I know a person's face and I know their Ravelry ID and for some reason I haven't put the two together. Um, so definitely uh, let me know who you are so when you when you stop by so I can I can put your face with your Ravelry ID. And, uh, and good luck. I hope that that knitting, um, knitting excitement comes back to you.
The next question comes from Amanda B who asks, what surprised you the most about starting owning your own hand dyed yarn business? So what surprised me the most is that I started it at all. Um, not so much that I started a business because I have done various other businessy entrepreneurial types of things in the past, um, but the fact that I started dyeing yarn uh, because there was a time, a lot of time, where I actually said I would never ever be interested in dyeing yarn. That's just something that I am not going to get into. I know that it would not be something I, it, it is something I would not enjoy. I had a friend who did a little bit of um, a food coloring dyeing and she was, you know, sharing her experiences with me. I'm like, nope, not interested, not going to do it. Never, never, never. <laughs> Definitely I have learned not to say never because that usually comes back to, to, to bite me. Um, because when I actually finally gave yarn dyeing a try, I realized I love it. It is so much fun. So much work, but so much fun. And um, yeah, so the the question was what surprised me the most. So that is what surprised me the most that I actually did it to begin with. So the next question comes from a simple motif and she asks, have you thought any more about your idea for the Round Table Yarns multi-designer pattern collection? Yes, next segment, no, just kidding. <laughs> um, yes, yes, I have thought about it. So um, for those of you, if you don't remember, I mentioned, it's been a while, that I feel that, um, that right now I'm, I'm not really um, feeling the inspiration and the motivation to do designing myself, um, but I do have an idea for an, a, a next book and I would still like to pursue that idea, but I was thinking that I would do that as a collection of designs from other designers, um, all using round table yarns. So a um, little bit of background if you're, if you are a newer viewer or if you don't remember me talking about that on a quite a while ago episode. Um, so yes, yes, I definitely still have that in mind. It is still something that I, I would like to do. Um, however, in complete honesty and transparency here, um, at this point, it really boils down to finances. Um, right now, it is not something that Round Table Yarns can handle. So, and I'm going to give you actual numbers here. Um, looking at Parliament of Cows, so the book that I released, um, can't believe last summer, that book um, putting together all the expenses. So that includes, um, the, the yarn itself, even though it's my yarn, obviously I still have to, to buy the, the base yarn. Um, the, um, tech editing of the patterns, the copy editing of the, the, all the content, the photography, the graphic design, the layout of the book, and then the print run because, you know, um, since I, I'm doing a, um, it is a print on demand. Um, so I, I can order as many copies or as few copies as I want, but I still have to, to pay for those up front. So all of that together was right around $2,000 to put that book together. Um, and the book's cover price is $20. So in order to break, e just to break even on the book, I needed to sell 100 copies. And I'm going to be straight up honest with you guys, I have not sold 100 copies. Um, my print run was 120 and I don't remember exactly how many I have right now, um, still remaining, but I know it's over 20. I think it's over 20, but less than 30. So, so I'm close, but, but not quite there. Um, and some of those, some of the copies were done as giveaways. Um, definitely two that I can think of, maybe even three or four. Um, and then some of them were sold um, through either the, the initial book release um, trunk show at the Knitting Fairy or um, later at, at the Knitting Fairy. And so um, there was a commission that was paid to the yarn shop, which by the way, I am totally happy to do, very happy um, to, to support a, um, a local shop. But that does mean that that is kind of more on the expense side of things and less on the, the income. So that book still has not even broken even. So with that in mind, um, it is an investment to put together a book. 
And with a book with um, additional designers, not only would I have all of the costs that go into, um, into, into putting the book together um, that I experienced with, um, with the previous books, but I also need to pay the designers. And I feel very strongly in paying designers fairly. So looking at the, um, the type of rights that I would, would want, um, basically exclusive rights for either six months or a year, um, I, I would have to, I need to, to think more specifically about that. Basically where um, the designer is not allowed to release the design anywhere else, it is exclusive to the book for that length of time. And then after that length of time is over, the rights revert back to the designer and um, he or she would be able to self-publish the pattern on Ravelry or anywhere else. Um, so with that in mind, I don't necessarily have to pay them as much up front since they would be getting their rights back. Um, and then I most likely they would be able to use the tech edited version. I would have to talk to the photographer to see if the designer could use the, um, the photographs or if the designer would be responsible for taking their own if they wanted to, um, to publish the design um, themselves after the exclusivity period is over. But probably I am looking at between two to $300 um, to pay for, for each design. So I don't, I don't have um, the specifics planned out for, for the book, but I'm kind of feeling like seven. This, this is a, a type of theme that I could have as many or as few designs as possible, but I'm kind of feeling like seven would be the, the right number for this book. Um, and possibly I would design one of those myself. So um, I wouldn't have to, to, to pay myself the designer fee, but so let's say six or seven patterns that I'm paying a designer and we'll do the, the um, top one, $300 for, so we'll say six patterns, that's $1,800 on top of the $2,000. Um, plus if I'm, I'm doing um, multiple designers, hopefully more would sell. So that means I would want to make a bigger initial print run, which means I would need additional money up front um, for, the, for the print run. Um, so we're looking at probably at least 4,000, maybe even upward to $5,000 that I need to produce the book. And I gotta tell you, I do not have that money in the Round Table Yarns checking account right now. That, that, I, not even to spare. I do not even have, complete honestly, I do not even have that much money um, right now. There are ways that I can go about financing the book um, to help offset the cost of the print run. I can do pre-orders, which is, what basically kind of I did with Parliament of Cows, although it, the pre-orders didn't completely cover that. Um, but that but that can definitely help. Um, I could potentially do a crowdsourcing type of thing. I did do that with um, my first book with Gawain Shield and got, um, got a little bit of money up front to help finance that. So that is a possibility. However, with that, I have to take into consideration that usually there are perks that are provided. Um, for people who um, who donate for the the crowdfunding, so I also have to kind of keep that into consideration as far as the expenses um, and make sure that is covered. So there are ways that I could go about um, getting the say roughly four thousand dollars that I need to produce the book, but um, but yeah, that is honestly the um, the true transparent reason of why nothing has really moved forward with that until I feel like I, um, until I feel secure in being able to finance it. I don't even want to start talking to other designers and, and trying to get designs because I don't feel that that's fair to them um, to make them even think about the project um, unless I know for sure that it's going to, to get off the ground. So if you have any suggestions, if you, if you think that you would be interested in, in contributing toward crowdfunding, um, I also thought about doing Patreon, um, where it basically Patreon is, is where people sign up to do kind of usually either a monthly or sometimes by project um, um, contribution. And, and then there are, are perks. It, it is a, a crowdfunding thing, but it's more of a, an ongoing type of thing instead of a one-time um, one donation. So, so I've been thinking about things like that, but, um, but I also feel like I, 
in many ways have overcommitted myself to things. And so I'm trying to, to not jump into everything, every idea that I have, um, which is one reason I haven't set up Patreon or, or something like that. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's the, the honest truth of why that project hasn't moved forward. Um, just because I need to, to figure out where the money is going to come from. Um, otherwise I, I still, I still want to do it. I'm still excited about it. Even though it's been in the back of my mind, it, it's, it's been in the back of my mind pretty constantly. And, and I do, um, I do think about it quite a bit. So keep asking about it. Keep reminding me if I know that there's interest in it, then that helps kind of push me forward into trying to figure out the, the finance side of things. And the final question comes from PTM Smith. Have you ever thought about doing special yarn colors that mix Arthurian stories with some of the other universes that you love? For example, Morgan Le Fay meets, um, meets um, Tilk. It's a Stargate SG-1. Um, so Stargate SG-1 had storylines that heavily involved Merlin and Morgan Le Fay. Um, they were ancients. So yeah, I watched I watched the Stargate movie, and then I watched a little bit of the TV show. Obviously, I don't even know enough to know how to pronounce the character's name. It's been a very long time. Um, but knowing now that, that there are, is some Merlin and Morgan Le Fay stuff in there, maybe I should go back and, and watch that. Um, and then she says, I'm not sure if Harry Potter or Doctor Who ever referenced Arthur or any of the stories, but I thought it might be fun to do some kind of mashup. Yeah, absolutely. I think it would be fun. Um, and I probably should look into that more. I do have what I think of as my Doctor Who color, the self-striping once in future. That's the gray and uh, and blue self-striping, a two-striper. Um, mostly because the, the gray and the blue are the two colors that I use for my Don't Blink scarf, um, which was Doctor Who inspired. And then I called it once in future because Arthur himself is, is the once in future king, the one who is supposed to return when England is at its greatest need. Um, and I kind of feel like Doctor Who does that. Um, especially he comes, he or she, um, comes whenever England is in need. And yes, has helped other um, planets and, and even America ones. Um, but, uh, but mostly it's England helping whenever it's in need. Um, and so I kind of feel that, that connection between Doctor Who and Arthur. So that's why Once in Future is, to me, that's, that's my Doctor Who colorway. Um, but I haven't really thought a lot about, um, about other, other mashups. I would have to, I'd have to do some brainstorming and coming up, come up with some things. Um, because just off the, the top of my head, that's the only one that I, I can really think of. So I'd have to do some thinking. If you have some suggestions, that would be awesome. Um, I would want it to be something that I am familiar with myself, um, just because I, I don't feel comfortable necessarily putting, um, putting something out there that I'm not personally familiar with. Um, but if, you know, if it's something that, that you want to recommend that maybe I should, I should watch or read, um, and then be inspired by, then I definitely, um, would love to, to hear some of those recommendations. So yes, I'm open to the possibility. Um, and that is something that I think I will, I will look into and see, see what I can come up with. Um, and then there is a second question. Um, or perhaps a collaboration with other indie dyers in the Metroplex, Metroplex that showcase Texas fiber arts. Um, yes, that would be fabulous. I don't know exactly um, what kind of, of collaboration, but I would love to participate in that. However, and this kind of goes back into my, um, I feel like I've, I've overextended myself in some ways. Um, I don't think that I can be the one to organize that. I, I just feel like um, I, would, I would be stretching myself a little thin if I tried to do that. I would love to do it. I would love to participate, but I don't think that I can be the one to spearhead it, to, to start it. Um, Yarn Carnival, so the, the husband and wife team there, has kind of started the um, We Knit in Texas, um, Texas Fiber Arts thing. So perhaps this is something that they are potentially working on. Um, I'm not really sure. Um, but that might be something more um, looking at, at what, what they're kind of doing and, um, 
and trying to get some type of collaboration. Um, maybe suggestions on what you guys would like to see. Um, I mean, we sometimes, you know, um, local designers and dyers will do some type of collaboration. Um, but if there is something more, something more, something more specific, um, maybe uh, trunk shows that are um, together rather than um, this person does a trunk show here and this person does a trunk show there. Maybe if we do um, kind of a bigger, you know, it's not a full fiber festival, but having multiple um, people doing a trunk show. I'd love to, to hear what you have to say. Like I said, I'm not personally interested in necessarily organizing it. Um, but I would definitely love to participate and, um, and to hear some thoughts and to possibly pass them on to people who might actually want to do some of the organization. So, um, so thank you for your suggestions. Um, and also, everyone, thank you for all of your questions. Uh, there are a couple more things that I want to say in this episode, so I will move on to those. Um, but I hope that, that you enjoyed this, this Q&A episode. So the Q&A thread or Q&A episode actually comes at a pretty good time because unfortunately I have not been doing a lot of knitting the past two weeks. Um, so last time on the previous episode, we had just gotten Luna. Um, she was eight weeks old when we got, when we got her. So now she, um, this weekend she'll be 10 weeks old. Um, and so we're, we're still doing a lot of, a lot of puppy training and she's taking up quite a bit of time. Um, which is which is fine. I know um, a she a, she's super cute, and I don't mind the time. And I know that as she gets older, um, it won't be quite this this intense. So that's fine. Anyway, but it, it has impacted my knitting. So um, basically, the biggest thing is that I usually knit in the mornings. Uh, I get up a little bit before everyone else, and I have my coffee, and I do some knitting, and then I also knit in the evenings um, when my husband and I sit down and watch TV. So um, basically, I've had very little morning knitting time because um, because Luna's been been needing to to get up and um, be taken out, even though my husband does do much of that himself. Um, because even though um, even though I'm, I'm really happy with Luna, really she is my husband's dog, and he's the one who's supposed to be taking care of her. Um, I, I kind of wore this shirt on purpose. I I, I, lo I love Luna. But I'm still a cat person at heart. Yeah. Um, Wally and Eva definitely are um, are mine. And, and Luna is my husband's. Anyway, that I'm talking about knitting, not about the dog. Um, so yeah, so my morning knitting time has um, has pretty much gone almost to, to zero. And then my evening knitting time, um, because it's been kind of broken up with um, with getting up and, and, and taking care of the dog, um, and then having the dog either be sitting near me or actually having Wally especially um, be sitting near me because I do think that he feels a little bit um, a little bit jealous. So I've been paying extra attention to him. It is hard to knit when he's directly in my lap. Um, it's a lot easier when he's sitting beside me. So anyway, so all of that is, has affected my knitting. So pretty much the only thing that I've been working on is my Tsunami shawl. So I have made some progress. I think I was in, I hope it was the middle of this section. It may have been the middle of this section. I think it was the middle of this section. Um, when I last showed this on the podcast. So I have made some progress, slow going, but still some progress. And hopefully the orange is a little truer to its actual color um, 
the um, someone at my knitting group uh, said that when, when she saw this in person at knitting group that it looked very different from what it was looking like on the screen that it, she liked it a lot better in person so if you're looking at this and thinking I don't know hopefully seeing it in person um, she said it, it looked a lot better so sorry about maybe not showing it off to best advantage here on the screen anyway so so I'm working on that enjoying it it is a really fun knit um so that's pretty much all my progress I've done a little bit on the socks that I've been working on with the brazen sutra color I've done a little bit on boxy um have not touched our gazing because like I mentioned knitting with beads um with the dog actually I don't think I've mentioned that um I recorded this section at, after I recorded the section I'm planning on putting next. Um, so I'm kind of getting confused about what I've already talked about. You haven't heard it yet. Um, so stargazing with beads. It's a little hard to do um, with uh, with the dog around. Anyway, so, uh, so yeah. So this is pretty much what's gotten my focus, and this is what I've been working on. Uh, like I said, I hope to, once the dog is getting more settled, I hope to be able to, to get back to my usual routines and my usual knitting times. Part of the problem is that my husband is away on a business trip right now. So, um, so this past week, everything about the dog has been me. I've had to deal with all of it. Um, he will be back soon and then I can at least share the dog duties with him. Um, but that has definitely also made a huge impact. Anyway. So, um, so yeah, this is pretty much it. And I hope to have more to share with you guys the next time that I record. So a reminder about this quarter's knit along. So it is any shawl that is science or math themed and we're, we're being pretty flexible on exactly how that theme covers it. My tsunami shawl that I am working on um, technically is, is covering, um, considered part of the science, um, science theme. So that is my contribution. I also have stargazing that I am still working on. But because it has beads and because of the puppy, I haven't really been knitting with beads out. Um, so that one may not get done in time for the end of the, the knit along, but I am still working on it. Anyway, I hope you guys are working on your projects. Some of you have posted to the chat thread and I've been enjoying uh, seeing what you guys have posted. I'd love to hear more. Don't forget to post in the FO thread. Um, the FO thread, because I started it at the beginning of the quarter and nobody has posted in it so far, um, the thread got inactive, it got buried, it was still there, but when you were just viewing it from, um, from your big view of all of your forums, um, it was hiding, basically. So I, I posted um, a little post to, to bump the thread to make it so it shows again. Um, I wasn't sure if, if maybe people hadn't posted because you, you weren't seeing the FO thread. So I wanted to make sure that it was visible. Um, so it is there. Please post if you have a finished object because we have two really fabulous prizes for this quarter's knit along. The um, sock blank, and I should have pulled them out to show you guys. Um, the sock blank from um, Panorama Fiber Arts that is the beautiful gradient. And then we have that gorgeous, gorgeous nebula. Um, I think it was Veil Nebula is the colorway from Elemental Fiber Works. So two really fabulous prizes right now. The odds are really good since there are no FOs. If you post an FO, um, you have really good odds of winning. Um, but I am excited to see what you guys are working on and what you are coming up with. So um, as soon as FOs get posted, I will be showing those on, um, on the podcast. Um, other quarterly news. Okay, so this quarter runs through the end of June. So you still have, you still have over a month. So um, make sure that you are knitting or crocheting. I would love to see some crocheted projects. Um, make sure that you are finishing up by the end of June and posting in the FO thread. So thank you very much for watching this episode. Um, like I said, I hope you enjoyed learning um, other stuff with the, the Q&A rather than the usual format. Um, if you like the Q&A episodes, if you want me to do them a little more often, um, like maybe every three or four months rather than once a year, let me know. Um, I think they're fun uh, to kind of shake up the format a little bit. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't want to do them all the time, but um, but if you if you don't want to wait a full year for the next one, let me know and I will set something up and um, 
four, five, six months, however long you think um, would be good before the next one. Anyway, speaking of kind of scheduling, since we are entering the summer and today, um, at least the day I'm recording, like I said, I'll probably be releasing this on Thursday as usual, but I'm recording this on Wednesday. Today is Luke's last day of school, his last day of kindergarten. So he will be home for the summer starting tomorrow. And when he is home, it is a little more difficult to record the podcast episodes. Um, he will be perfectly happy playing in his playroom and I will start recording and suddenly he is not happy playing anymore and he wants to know what's going on because he hears me talking. Um, and so he does a lot of interrupting, which sometimes is is good. Um, and sometimes I've kept him, um, his interruptions in the, the episode. And sometimes it means I have to stop and either start over that segment or, um, or to, to splice things together. Um, anyway, so it makes, um, it makes recording the podcast take even more time than usual. Um, because I um, because I have some acute, but um, but I have some interruptions. Anyway, so so it is a little bit more challenging. So as a result, I'm not entirely sure that I will be able to keep up with my every other Thursday exact schedule. So I'm going to just allow myself, um, kind of in my um, my trying to to not not add a lot of stress um, a stress to myself. I'm going to give myself permission and allow myself to not hold to a rigid schedule over the summer. Um, I know that might be disappointing to you guys who um, who look forward to the episodes um, and knowing that you're going to get them, you know, every other Thursday. I will do my best to um, to post, you know, every couple of weeks so that way I'm not having huge gaps in between the episodes but the schedule is going to be a little bit more sporadic and I'm going to apologize in advance for that. Um, so um, we'll, we'll kind of see what happens. I'll have to play it by ear. He's got, it's later in the summer, but he's got some Lego camp um, afternoons that he's going to. So, um, so there are some times where I can take him to Lego camp and come home and, and do a little bit of recording or something. So on, on some of those days, that'll be a little bit easier. Um, but other days, I don't know. I'm not really sure what our schedule will be like either. So I just want to give you a heads up that over the summer, recording is going to be a little more sporadic. Um, he goes back to school mid-August. So once he goes back to school, I'll get back into the regular schedule again. So the best way to find out when an episode is posted is to make sure you're subscribed to YouTube um, and or really hope that you do both. Uh, you are a member of the Ravelry group for the podcast. Um, if you're not a member yet, it is T-Shirts and Shawls Podcast. Uh, I link to it in the show notes. Um, or you can just search Ravelry for T-Shirts and Shawls. Anyway, um, because whenever there is a new episode, I post it in a thread on the Ravelry group. So that is uh, probably the best way to find out when a new episode is posted. But I, I do hope, if you have not already, that you will subscribe on YouTube. Um, so that way you'll get notifications that way. And then also, um, as you guys have been doing um, recently, please post your comments both, um, either or both on YouTube here underneath the video or on the Ravelry discussion thread. Um, I'm loving seeing your comments on YouTube. Thank you guys so much for doing that. Um, it really is making a difference. Um, but I don't want the discussion on Ravelry to, to go quiet, so make, please make sure you're, you're also going over there and, and posting and discussing there. Because uh, like I said, that really is my favorite part, and especially the interaction that you guys have with one another, not just back and forth between you and me. Um, so yeah, so sorry about the upcoming sporadic um, scheduling, but I will do my best to, um, to make it as regular as possible. Hope you guys are working on your shawl for this quarter's nail long. Please post a comment. I'd love to hear your feedback. And if you do have questions for me um, that you want me to answer on a podcast, I do have that questions for Karen thread. So even if we're not doing a full Q&A episode, you can still get your questions answered. So again, thank you so much for watching. Not sure exactly when next time will be, but until then, happy knitting.